at any rate, at the time of Noble Utu Ali's death, another man came upon the scene. And he identified himself as a Meccan, that he was a descendant of the royal family of Muhammad ibn Abdullah of Saudi Arabia, the founder of the Islamic faith. This is an early photograph or an enhanced portrait of Wallace D. Farad, the actual founder of the Nation of Islam. Elijah Muhammad will become Wallace D. Farad's first student. In 1932, though, only two years after Wallace D. Farad founded the Nation of Islam, trouble again was on the horizon, mainly because Wallace D. Farad had some rather controversial teach teachings. He taught that he was the last messenger of Allah and not Muhammad ibn Abdullah of the seventh century. And he also taught his, his followers that if they killed four white people or a combination of white people and blacks who were traitors to the black race, that they would automatically go to heaven and receive a star and get a free trip to Mecca. One of these believers, Robert Kareem, took Wallace E. Farr's teachings to heart, and he began to take on victims. His first victim was a black man, but he had laid on a table or an altar, makeshift altar in his apartment, and uh, ran a knife through the man's heart. The man survived and tried to escape, and at that point, Kareem took a, an axle from a car, part of an axle at least, and bl bludgeoned the man to death, and then stabbed him several times in the heart to complete the sacrificial murder. When neighbors found out about the murder, they summoned police. And the police, two days later, as you can see, this happened on November 21st, 1920, 1932. Two days later, the police went to the Fraymore Hotel in, in Detroit, where Wallace D. Fard set up shop, where he lived, basically. They arrested him as an accessory to murder. And this is the copy of the arrest record. He was identified as a 34-year-old black male. And here, of course, is one of the early flyers asking black people to join the Nation of Islam. What had happened also is that Fard was a very popular man in Detroit. Even though he was white in appearance, he said that he was Asiatic. He had attracted more than 7,000 members to the Nation of Islam by 1932. This was the height of his power. After this sacrificial murder, though, things became bad for Wallace D. Farr. The police were constantly, constantly on him. They asked him several times to leave town, and the black community, the uh, Urban League and the NAACP had also asked that Farr be driven out of Detroit. He stuck around, though, because he had a very large nation, as he saw it, to govern. Six months after the uh, arrest of Fard, he was arrested again. This was in May of 1933. As you can see the date on this arrest photograph, or mugshot, May 26, 1933. This becomes important because this is Wallace D. Fard's arrest record right here. And Elijah Muhammad has written several times that Wallace D. Fard was arrested and driven, driven out of Detroit in May of 1933, to be, May 26 to be exact. And again, Notice this, though. When he's arrested the second time, he's identified as a 33-year-old white male. This, by the way, is Fard's arrest record. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, FBI file, which is available on the web for anyone who has doubts about something you may hear here tonight. It's at FBI.gov, FBI.gov. .gov. You can read Wallace C. Fard's entire main FBI file, over 800 pages. This photograph and these documents are also on the website for independent verification. Something strange happened after Wallace D. Fard ran into trouble with the FBI and the local Detroit Police Department. Elijah Muhammad began producing a paper called The Final Call to Islam, not to be uh, confused with The Final Call that's published by Louis Farrakhan. This was the first edition of The Final Call to Islam. This is actually the third issue of The Final Call. Note here that Elijah Muhammad is identified not as a prophet, as he would later be identified, but simply as a minister of the Nation of Islam. Note also here that prophet, or Wallace Deepard, is not identified as Allah, as he would later become identified with by the Nation of Islam. But he's identified as the prophet, Fard Muhammad. Very important distinction to make. Also notice here in this last segment of the paper where he's identified, where, he, where he's quoted as saying such, there is no God but Allah, and Muhammad, and Fard Muhammad is his prophet. So again, Fard insisted that he not be considered a messianic figure in terms of the deity. He urged Elijah Muhammad personally not to call him God. 
Elijah Muhammad had said once to him that, uh, I know who you are, you're God. And he said, don't, don't ever say that again, because you know, you'll, first of all, people will think I'm crazy, and they'll think you're crazy too, so don't even go there. But nevertheless, after Farr disappeared in, in April of 1934, Elijah Muhammad began to change the teachings. And gradually, in 1935, he began teaching that, uh, again, that he was the Messiah, that he was the last prophet of God, and that Wallace E. Farr was God himself. This caused a major conflict in 1935, uh, when, Wallace, when Elijah Muhammad's younger brother, Kalat, accused Elijah Muhammad of heresy. He says, what you have done is twisted the teachings of Wallace D. Fard and made them something that they are not. And so there became a blood feud between Elijah Muhammad and his younger brother, Kalat. Elijah Muhammad was threatened with death by his own brother and by other Muslims, and they ran him out of Detroit. For the next seven years, Elijah Muhammad was on the run from what he called the hypocrites, when in fact they said he was the hypocrite. As part of this counterintelligence program against the nation of Islam, the FBI, the FBI went back and began to look closely at Wallace D. Fard's background, and what they found astounded them. They found, by comparing Wallace D. Fard's fingerprints, that he was actually a petty criminal from Los Angeles named Wallace Dodd Ford. They also found out that he had been married and lived with a woman, a white woman, named Hazel Ford, and that he was identified on his marriage certificate as a white man. They also found the birth certificate of Wallace D. Ford's first child, who was called Wallace Max Ford, or Wallace, I'm sorry, Wallace Dodd Ford Jr., but this was later changed to Wallace Max Ford after his wife realized that he was connected to the Nation of Islam. This is a 1926 photograph of Wallace D. Ford on, on the way to San Quentin Prison with his best friend, Eugene Donaldson. And again, for anyone who questions my uh, very, very veracity here, this is all on the web at FBI.gov. Just type in Wallace D. Fard. They also found out about his parentage. Wallace D. Fard's parents were from New Zealand. They were of the Maori tribe, which, as you know, was a jet black tribe that had come down from India and resettled. His father was a black man a Muslim by birth, and his name was Zared Ford, or Zared Fard initially. His mother, however, was a, a Jewess, as they called him then, uh, a Jewish woman by birth, uh, who later was converted to Islam by her husband. But again, his mother was white, which is one of the more astounding facts about the nation of Islam, I think. As the campaign began, Elijah Muhammad was outraged, and he said it was a lie, and he printed an article in the front page of Muhammad Speaks offering anyone who could prove that Wallace D. Fard was Wallace D. Ford. He said, I'll give you $100,000. What happened is Hazel Ford heard about the uh, reward, went to the messenger and mailed various documents to him, showing beyond any doubt that she was married to Wallace D. Ford, a.k.a. Wallace D. Fard, or Wallace D. Ford, as some say. Nevertheless, the campaign failed. Elijah Muhammad refused to pay Wallace D. Ford's wife the money, because she said the fingerprints that I just showed you were doctored by the FBI. She went home empty-handed. My study began, and I, I wondered how much members of the Nation of Islam really knew about his origins. And I found out by interviewing Muslims that none of them knew where Shabazz was. They had heard about this great nation of the Shabazz all their lives, and none of them had ever asked, asked where Shabazz was. I also wondered why Elijah Muhammad was preaching that Wallace E. Fard was God when the initial papers clearly showed that Fard never condoned teaching that he was God. And so I began to investigate. And what I found out was that Shabazz actually exists. It exists today. It is in Pakistan. And in doing that research, I did some research on the name Kalat, because I couldn't find it in any name book, any dictionary, any encyclopedia. And so I did some research on the web, and I found that Kalat is a very uncommon name. In fact, of a million documents in the Washington Post database, I could find no references to Kalat. What I did find out, however, that Kalat was a small town in Pakistan. So again, the fact that Wallace D. Fard named Elijah Muhammad's brother Kalat goes back to his Pakistani roots. And again, the fact that the, oh, the mosque of Shabazz is located uh, in Pakistan certainly ties Wallace D. Fard to Pakistan. 
I also did some gene genealogical research on Wallace D. Bard, and I found out that as the FBI surmised in 1943, that he was in fact living in Los Angeles at the time when he was a young man, in 19, 19, when he was in his 20s. And as Hazel Ford says, his name was indeed Wally D. Ford. And it's here on the census report, the 14th census report for Los Angeles County. And if you go back and read some of Elijah Muhammad's books, he says very clearly that Wallace D. Farad, uh, a man identified as the, as the Allah, lived with a white family in Los Angeles while he was attending the University of California. Uh, turns out he did not attend the University of California, but he did in fact live with a white family, the Bushings. Uh, and the Bushings lived on Bunker Hill, which was a famous community, as you know, in Los Angeles. So again, the historical record documents now beyond any question, and this book contains an entire chapter on my findings, but basically Wallace D. Fard and Wallace D. Ford were one and the same. Now again, Farrakhan did not know about this, and none of the ministers knew about this. So this is all new, and this will be all new information to many Muslims. What I am hoping is that they do not act, react negatively. You know, if you find out something that's not true, then you ought not try to kill the messenger. What you ought to try to do is try to correct those mistakes so others don't grow up being ignorant. And when I heard Minister Farrakhan say recently that he had had an epiphany and that he was going to accept all men as brothers and stop teaching race-based Islam but go into the orthodoxy and teach true Islam, I was filled with hope because I think Minister Farrakhan has a great deal of potential not only for the African-American community but for America at large. Because if he could come out of, out, of his, out of his experience and move to the mainstream, then I think there's hope for many of the white races in this country that they can abandon racism and move to the mainstream and meet their black brothers and their Asian brothers halfway and that we can have some real racial harmony in this country.